Hello, Linwood. What a real pleasure to see you. How are you? I'm great, Barbara. How are you doing? How are you enjoying this time period? Well, you know what? One can look at it um, as a time of opportunity and a time of challenge. We're, um, we're doing very well uh, trying to keep up with that. One reason I want to talk to you today is, do you see this spiffy new background that I have? The which? My spiffy new Zoom background. Very nice. Is that, is that, that looks real to me. It's not. I'm actually not in my library, nor is the dog going to leap into life and bark. If you look carefully, you will see there's kind of a green halo around my head. Yeah. This is an experiment with this new green screen and uh, background image that you can install. It looks, it's very convincing. I thought that because I've seen your library at home and that looked very, I was, I, I'm convinced. Well, um, we'll see how it works. I think it's a lot more impressive than the file cabinet that's usually right behind me. So tell me about life in Toronto. Um, I've talked to Ian Rankin in Edinburgh. I've talked to people in New York and so forth, but I don't think I've yet had a chance to check in with a Canadian. No, that's not true. Peter Robinson and I did talk um, a, a few days back. So Peter and I would probably be having the same kind of experience. Um, you know, we've we've never gone into kind of the lockdown that they've had, say, in England and other places or France, where they didn't even want you to leave the house. You could leave to walk your dog or whatever, and that was it. It's never been like that. But um, we're we have only kind of, you know you could go out, you could go for a walk, but you couldn't go to parks. You couldn't you know congregate in large groups and so forth. But we would take like we live in downtown Toronto, and we would try to take a walk every day walking through the sort of post-apocalyptic neighborhood when you approach somebody on a sidewalk somebody goes into the street then you go back like this and so forth so and and um i've learned how to deposit checks with a phone by taking an image that's probably my big techie advantage there or learning curve our kids uh who are you know grown kids who are convinced that we are vulnerable geezers have uh, volunteered to do our grocery shopping. So they, every week they ask for a list and then they bring our groceries by. So uh, if we've, and if we've gone out the odd time to pick up something, we don't tell them because they'll be very upset with us. Um, but you know, there, there's a sort of gradual reopening now, sort of storefronts that are on the street uh, are being allowed to open to some degree um, as opposed to say a big mall where everybody goes inside and it's congested, they're not open, but you know, so we've, we've got that. And we've been doing our, you know, I wish we have a favorite restaurant that is approximately a three minute walk from our house down the bottom of the street and on Queen and you hang on left. And all I want to do is just go back and sit there and have a glass of wine, but that's, we've done takeout from there, but you know, to be able to sit out and go somewhere, that, that's still somewhat elusive. So how's it been for you creatively with all this extra time? Do you find that you've been able to do more work or do you find that it's been so unnerving you actually can't? Well, it's funny. Today, um, I, well, I'll just, let me backtrack. So I uh, delivered next year's book uh, to my publishers the last week of February. And then I had a screenplay adaptation, a second draft. I was working on our third, uh, first week of March, and I got those done. And then those were, all my work was off my plate. I didn't have anything to worry about. And so I was sort of thinking, well, maybe we should go away or we should go do something. And within about five days after that, we went into all this self-imposed isolation in Toronto and you couldn't go anywhere. So for about the first five weeks, I had no work to do. And I'm a model train nerd. So I worked on my lab in the basement for about five weeks and we watched, pinge watch shows and so forth. And then uh, around about sometime in, when was it? I guess early May, I got notes back on my novel. So I was spent three weeks working on that. Now I'm back doing another draft on the screenplay. So I've had work to do, but I do think it's a little harder to concentrate. I find today sort of more than the coronavirus, but the sort of the political environment this is so unsettled that it's hard to focus to some degree, but I am getting some work done. Um, I mean, when you, you know, those of us who are writers, we work home in isolation all the time anyway. So in that sense, that's kind of a stay the same, 
But I think for all of us, it's hard to focus. I think you're right. And of course, inevitably, human nature being what it is, uh, even if we didn't want to go out, the fact that we can't go out makes us want to go out. And you know, mm -hmm. we have to, you know, we have to overcome that. So Linwood Elevator Pitch, your most recently published book, was um, an enormous success and such a such a terrific concept. Uh, did that set some kind of a bar that's a little bit intimidating, or do you feel like it's just another step in your fabulous uh, you know, and, I, and, and in a sense, I'm past it because I've already done another book since, um, which I'm kind of happy with. Um, but you are kind of your own worst enemy as a writer when you do a book that you're particularly pleased with and you feel like the next one has to top it. Um, so over the years, I've had, I think, where I, for myself, hit kind of high points. And then I think the next book won't be as good as this. And maybe it's not. So you kind of go down a bit and then you're up. It's a bit like that. But it's ultimately readers who judge you in that way. I mean, I have, I have people occasionally get in touch with me. I won't even say which book it is. But they say, oh, of all my books, that my favorite is such and such. And I think, that's the one book I'm so unhappy with. But it, And I feel it would be rude to tell them they're wrong. But, um, but you know, it's, but it's, but I, I think the next book's kind of interesting. Um, I'm kind of pleased with it. I actually have two books in the bank right now. The one that would, the, for next, next year. And the other thing is, of course, this will be, 2020, will be the first year since 2004 where I didn't have a book out in the actual calendar year. Uh, and some years there were two, but in 2020, there'll be no new book from me. We had already planned to push my September release to January because we felt that the U.S. election would be just so overwhelming in terms of news coverage that you couldn't get any attention for anything else. So we thought, let's push it to January. And then, excuse me, then the, the whole COVID-19 thing hit and a lot of books are getting pushed further out. And so now I think it's likely that in, in the US and Canada, my next book won't come out until May of next year. And although I think in the UK, it'll be February. It has played havoc with publisher calendars. I, we did very well um, at the Poison Pen in April and May. Mm -hmm. But June is a positive desert because so many publishers decided that they would move their books further ahead in order to have more time to adjust to all of this. So I'm really concerned about June, but also mm -hmm. there's a lot of vacant space available from July through November because people decided that uh, in an election year that it would not be a great idea to publish too heavily for various right. reasons. And now suddenly there we are. Um, so where August would have been normally every year is a very weak month, this year August is going to be absolutely huge, but it'll be huge because of the number of books that moved to August. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and, you know, it's and, a different rhythm. And I think I might have told you at some point, I mean, I had written another novel or last, last year that was a little different than what I typically do. It was more like a Michael Crichton thriller. So it was not quite what I usually do. And my publishers have been sort of trying to figure out what to do with this book. And, and so the feeling was we do it as a kind of maybe trade paperback original next summer. But now if my regular annual thriller gets pushed into next May, then we won't do that book then. So I don't know when it's we're gonna, what we're going to do with that. So uh, it's, yeah, it's just, it's kind of just thrown a monkey wrench into everything. Well, you answer to three publishers because being Canadian, um, you have that to do. You have a U.S. publisher, but your U.K. publisher for a long time may have been your primary publisher. So yeah. you have to figure out their calendars. And of course, I have done a few changes in, I mean, I'm now with uh, HarperCollins everywhere in, in English-speaking markets. So they're kind of you know, talking to each other and aligning efforts, which I hope will be a good thing for me. Well, yeah, I think dovetailing, as well, publishing is definitely becoming more global. So certainly dovetailing seems to me a, a really good idea. So talk to me a little bit about standalones versus series. You've done both. Elevator Pitch was the standalone, but yep. you had written what was going to be, what, three books, and then you suck in the fourth, you rascal, um, before. Yeah, I had done, uh, I have done both. I, 
The promise, I did what I call my Promise False Trilogy, Broken Promise, Far From True, and The 23, which I guess was a series, although I think of a series as being a little different where you kind of have, a, have one particular character and then do a new novel with them every year. The trilogy was a little different because the, the, the lead character kind of rotated and so forth. And of course, years ago, I did um, four novels about a character named Zach Walker and, and so forth. But for the, for the most part, the last several years, I've been doing standalones. And I don't see going back to a series or anything like that in the foreseeable future. I do think that my character, Barbara, from Elevator Pitch, if I too were to consider doing it, would be such an easy character to bring back. And I really liked her. Um, but, um, but no, I, I, I mean, the great thing about a series is you can do whatever you want to these people. Um, you know, you know, you can knock them off or do any horrible thing to them because you're not going to bring them back again. And yet the flip side, the great thing about writing a series is, you know, half your work is done. You start a new novel and you think, well, I have my locale, I have my characters, I have my sort of, it, my relationships are done. I just need a new adventure for them. And I think in that sense, a series is, can be a, and for, as a writer, it would be a great comfort to do those. I'm sure you're right. You and I have had a lot of conversations, and I've always had the idea that, or the impression, to be fair, um, that your mind tends to work in incidents that really fit a standalone better, where you can create yeah. some amazing incident and put everybody in jeopardy. And it's certainly in a standalone, you can kill off everyone, including the narrator, the lead character. Uh, whereas the series, as you say, you've got the comfort of having done the world building and so forth, but then there's always that that security for at least one lead character and probably the dog if they're, or whatever animals in it that they're going to survive. Um, and and I sort of, I think that you you think better, more comfortably okay. maybe in terms of standalones. I think that, I mean, I haven't so much described my work this way, but others have said a lot of my plots are what they call high concept. You know, like elevator pitch, a serial killer who's killing people by sabotaging elevators, or, or trust your eyes where someone sees uh, what they think is a murder on Google Street View. So you have a kind of, I kind of start with that high concept. And I don't think you could do a series character as easily where every plot was a kind of high concept plot. No, I think you're right. It would be exhausting. So a corollary question would be, what sparks off your imagination? I mean, most people ride elevators and never even think about a serial killer using it as a weapon. I think, now, and I hope, I hope you're not hearing too much background. We've got the, the garbage truck is going by on the street, so if you still hear a loud humming, we'll just try to ignore that. Um, but, um, sorry, the noise distracted me from your very question, which was, Oh, oh, my question was, what sparks off your imagination in a way that um, most people would not get into an elevator and automatically think of it as a weapon for a serial killing? I think, I, I don't know. Well, that particular idea rose out of the fact that there was a, an item on the local news in Toronto where we have a, just scads of high-rise condo towers going up, just like Hong Kong. Um, and there was an item on the news that said the city had not didn't have enough elevator inspectors to keep up with that and there hadn't been a problem but when i heard the news the idea was just there like what if you had a guy who was offing his victims by sabotaging the elevator so it just was there but i think that at times ideas for me come from the fact that i i think underneath i'm a very anxiety riddled person and so i see situations and how they could go horribly wrong even very sort of everyday things and and I think that's kind of what sparks things for me. If I were a totally relaxed individual, I think I'd have a much harder time doing this, but I'm just always looking for things to go wrong. Hmm. So hang, high anxiety plays into your, um, into your process. Do you think that your journalism background also has an influence in how you view um, the world and setting up stories? I think so. I think it does. I like to know how, sort of how things work. And although I think having worked all those years in newspapers also, not even so much storylines, but affects how I do my work. Because, um, you know, everybody talks about writer's block and do you have writer's block? And I think you can't have writer's block when you work in a newspaper. Writing, writing is a job. So I sit down and I go to work. And so that's, that's kind of my work ethic, that even if you're not feeling it, 
you have to do it because it's a job. And so um, I think that's a large part of it as well. Some, some aspects of my journalism career, such as it was, have found their way into my novels as kind of background bits of information. Um, and, and of course, books that I've done that are set in a newspaper, I know how newspapers work. And so um, that, that background knowledge is helpful. Well, they certainly have earned you with research skills. So another question that occurred to me while we were talking is, you know, do you, you're, you're really an international bestseller. Um, do you, are you conscious of writing for any particular national audience or are you just writing for what you think of as your reader, regardless of whether that reader, where that reader might happen to live? I just, uh, I don't think about that. I mean, I think, um, and if you did, I don't know how you can even do it. Like if, you know, I'd sell really well in France. I mean, what, how would I write a book differently or that I think, well, this will work in France, but will also work in America or whatever. I just don't think there'd be a way to do that. I just think that you, if you write about themes that are more or less universal, that they're, they should work in most markets. I mean, we're all very much the same in a lot of ways. We all have the same worries and anxieties. We're worried about our family. We're worried about our jobs. We, you know, those, if you can tap into those kinds of things, I think that you'll, you'll find that you'll have readers wherever people pick up books. Well, you do also do very well writing about ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, much more than some sort of superhero, you know, yeah. who has a a whole quiver full of skills, you know, and is set to draw an arrow and fire it, um, if, if the case may be. So that's universal. Yeah, I, I just figure I, you know, it's been ages since I tried to smuggle plutonium or anything. I just don't have any expertise in that kind of super spy stuff. And I've never been a cop. Or anything. So I just think, well, how would someone like me with no skills and dealing with evil bad people how would i handle that my first inclination would be to run and so i'll try to write a story and my character would probably have want to run but the stakes are so high that he can't well that makes perfectly good sense um since you are a canadian author even if you are writing for a more universal stage what what is Canada's network for for authors? I'm familiar with I, I belong to all three, or at least I used to all three crime writers associations in England, mm -hmm. Canada, and the United States. Is there a like a broad based support group in Canada for authors? There's crime writers in Canada uh, who um, I belong to for many years, and they have an you know they have a an annual award called the Arthur Ellis, uh, who was the sort of nom de plume of, of Canada's hangman. When Canada had capital punishment, that was supposedly the, the, the name they gave, I think, to that person, even if it wasn't his name, you know. And so uh, it's a nice group of people um, uh, that we have here, the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, they haven't, uh, this year's, uh, the celebration for the, Ar the Arthur Ellis Awards would have been I think two weeks ago, of course, was not held. It's usually in Toronto here. But they're nice. They're a nice bunch of people, and uh, I'm pleased to be a member of that. Years ago, when my husband and I swapped bookstores with Sleuth of Baker Street, one of the Toronto major bookstores at that time, and that was back. Gosh, I think it might have been back in the '90s. We were actually in Toronto and hosted the Arthur Ellis Awards at at Sleuth. Uh, they didn't like that swap because it was like 110 here in Phoenix and you know, it was very comfortable in Canada. So we never could persuade them to do it again. But it was, it was a wonderful experience. We got a chance to travel around Toronto and Eastern Canada, but just to work in the store and, um, and meet more Canadian authors and Canadian customers was, I think, very valuable. The Poison Pen, as you know, has a lot of Canadian customers. Yeah, I know. One of them I know, you know, pretty well. And it has a place not too far from ours. Is, well, I think a former one, perhaps, but it was Vicki Delaney, who I think has done, has done in the past done some books with you folks. But she's one of, you know, many, many crime writers working away in this country. Indeed so. Well, I'm sure to hear that you have a new book, two new books, <laughs> and possibly a third, um, in the works. So that's really very good news, Linwood. Yeah, I don't think I'll have to really sit down and start pl 
plotting out writing another one till maybe October. Um, but uh, and in the meantime, like I say, I've been I've been doing a screenplay on sort of on spec based on one of my books uh, with a producer who uh, I've worked with before, and we have a reasonably big name actor who's really interested in it, and I've got notes from him. So, so I'm tinkering away at that. Um, but I think uh, I'll have time to read a lot of books this summer. Oh, wonderful. Maybe you can send me some recommended, try it again, recommendations for some of our readers, which I will be glad to pass on. You know, the last time I was in Toronto, you and I had a wonderful lunch together. And now I look back and it's almost like before with a capital B. Uh, time. Oh, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hope that one way or another, we will be able to repeat that either here in Scottsdale or I will get back like to Toronto. I'd love that. Hey, you know what I've been reading lately? I, I've somehow been one of these people who just kind of never was aware of Philip Kerr. And, and so I've been reading, now he's passed away, but I've been reading him lately and I'm just kind of in awe of his ability. You know, it was really tragic that his life was shut, cut so short by kidney cancer. And I think then he was, uh, he was on a, a constant up, up, upgrade of the Bernie Gunther series. So it's really remarkable, but he wrote a lot of other books that are not Bernie. Um, mm -hmm. There was one I particularly loved about a Yeti, as I remember, but, and he wrote at least one historical. He had a, he had a really fine mind. We were lucky that we had him to visit us for every one but the last mm -hmm. of his books and learned a lot from him. He was Black Irish or Black Scottish. And I remember we had one conversation in which he told me how difficult it was for someone as dark as he to grow up in, in Scotland where people tended to, to view him racially when in fact there was no need for that. And certainly in light of current things that are going on, it, it came back to me to think about how wounding that was for him. We sat out on our patio one day and he, he talked about that, that kids in school were calling Blackie and how much, how much that hurt. So, you know, there's so much in the world that is unkind. We are trying to dwell on the kindness. I think of us as the good news bookstore. We tried very hard to, to make it a place where people can go and express ideas and commune with each other and not feel like it's just another round of the daily news. Might, yeah. might make us seem shallow, but we think it's actually a positive experience for people. Oh, I've always felt that. You're always my favorite stop on any tour. I don't know if we'll ever be doing book tours again, but I, if we are, I hope that uh, it includes Scottsdale. Well, you'll be cheered to know that um, yesterday while I was at the Mayo Clinic here in Scottsdale with for a completely non- COVID related uh, appointment, they feel like a lot of progress is being made. They are convinced that it is primarily an aerosol rather than a other transmitted thing. Um, that touching things, picking up books and so forth is not as dangerous as being around anyone who sneezes, coughs, talks loudly, is not wearing a mask and so forth. But I have faith that, that there will be a vaccine and you yeah. know, come on, you know, I'm almost 80 and I've been vaccinated like twice for smallpox because that's what everybody got. We know you, when you were a baby, you got vaccinated. Yeah. When I went to Europe for the first time in 1955, they insisted on a revaccination. So smallpox to me has never even been part of my life. And once we get to a, a vaccine and some sort of whatever it might be, I yeah. think that it'll be a bit like smallpox or the measles, but the hard part's to get there. Yeah. Well, it can't come soon enough. No, I totally agree. So I will live in the hope that you and I will once again sit across from the table and talk about books and actually drink some wine and consume food. But meanwhile, this has been lovely. This has been lovely. It's so nice to see you. Thank you, Linwood. You too. My best to everybody. Bye. Take care.